Ladies and gentlemen, you may be wondering why I'm walking outside, you know, on a grassy hill, all sweaty. Well, that's a good question. You may also be wondering why this video is so smooth. That's another good question. And well, today we're going to answer both of them. Also, it just rained and it's really wet. This was a bad idea. Hello and welcome back to another random Wednesday episode. Now, the answer to the questions asked in the intro is of course, as you would have guessed, a gimbal. Now, this is a sort of cool little filmmaking tool that helps you stabilize your video. Gimbals accept your image capture device, you know, a camera phone, you know, an actual DSLR camera, depending on what version you have. And the idea is you can actually walk, you can actually pan around and it will sort of dampen your motions. It will reduce camera shake significantly, allowing you to get very nice, smooth, buttery video. The one I have here is from a Chinese brand called Ziyun and it's the Smooth C Z1. So yeah, I'm not going to talk about this itself. There have been many reviews on this particular gimbal. So if you want to know more about this specific one, you can definitely, you know, search on YouTube. There are tons of them. What I want to do instead today is I want to talk a little bit about gimbals in general, what they are, how they work, and what's the best way to actually make use of them. So yeah, let's delve into that. So first and foremost, what is a gimbal? Now, if you were to actually look at, you know, the dictionary or scientific definition of what a gimbal is, actually, it's something that, well, allows an object to rotate in one axis of rotation. That's why it's normally visualized like this. You have something with, you know, these two spokes at the end. And basically, well, if you mount an object on the inside, the object is allowed to actually freely rotate along the axis in which, well, the spokes are actually, you know, pointing it. So what this means is what we call, you know, a gimbal like this one is actually a set of three gimbals because, well, they allow your device to actually rotate in three directions. The three directions are as follows. The pitch, which is of course, you know, whether the phone or whatever camera you're using is pointing up or down. The roll, which is kind of like, well, the phone or device rolling along its side, as well as the yaw which you can actually treat as the compass direction in which your device is facing. That is why three axis gimbals tend to be visualized like this. Basically, you have a set of three gimbals that are, you know, well embedded inside each other. And yeah, they basically are free to rotate. And if you have a device or whatever it is in the middle, it can actually point to, well, any direction in our 3D space. And yet, that still doesn't fully capture what one of these sort of video gimbals actually do. Because, well, a gimbal in and of itself is just something that allows an object to rotate. In this case, however, well, most of the time, we don't want the object to rotate. Mounting a device on the gimbal itself, of course, first and foremost, allows it to rotate freely. But what we're really trying to do is we're trying to actually counter any rope rotations. Now, what this means is these at the end, which, you know, help in the rotation of your device, are not in fact passive components. They are actually motors. The reason why we need this is because there is a sensor somewhere inside the body of your gimbal. The idea is it needs to detect, you know, the absolute rotation of either your camera or your phone or whatever device it is. And if it detects some shakes, you know, some deviations from the angle it's supposed to be at, what the motors do is they kick in, they provide what is known as a torque, a corrective torque in the opposite direction to the shake that you've given it. And that is what keeps your device stable. So what I've just said in words, I'm gonna just demonstrate to you here. Now notice that no matter how I tilt this device, right, the phone stays still. And the thing is, even if I shake it, well, it's able to detect sort of the motion that I'm sending in. And it's actually rotating my phone counter to the motion that I'm actually creating here. And that is how you get this kind of extremely stable performance, right? No matter what I do, the phone stays stock still. And that's basically how you achieve this sort of performance, right? No matter what I do, my phone stays stock still. I can even rotate the whole handle like this, right? But the phone's absolute rotation is known and well, the gimbal actually rotates to counter my movement. And that's why my phone sort of stays facing the exact same direction. So yeah, that's a gimbal. 
And that's, well, pretty cool, I would say. So what we've just understood about gimbals allows us to actually move into our first tip of the day, which is calibration. As mentioned, there is actually a sensor inside your gimbal that sort of helps detect its real world position. However, one flaw of the setup is that, well, everything that is being detected is relative to the sensor's exact orientation. And what that means, of course, is that, well, that might not necessarily tally with, you know, the device's orientation. There are other factors that may affect, you know, the readings that are coming out of the sensor. If we are actually, you know, going to be extremely pedantic and looking into a little details, even things like sort of a little change in weight distribution or some changes in temperature, well, all these could have some impact on the readings. So to get everything, you know, kind of synced up, what you have to go through is a process known as calibration. Now, even if your gimbal works out of the box, it would be nice to actually go through a calibration step. And essentially what you're doing is you're teaching your gimbal, you know, what direction corresponds to what. This process might take a couple of minutes and in my experience may even be a little bit frustrating. But the good news is you don't have to do it that often. And in fact, in my case for my gimbal, there are actually two different kinds of calibration. One very simple and very quick one that happens every time you actually start up the device, as well as another more complex one. And I've only done the complex one once and things have been working very well since then. However, if you're looking to purchase a gimbal, well, fresh out of the box, it is a very good idea to actually calibrate it once. So now let's move on to tip number two, known to many as the ninja walk, though on this channel, I've also called it the bent knee walk. Now, in order to understand why we need this, we need to understand a little bit about, you know, what the gimbal is actually doing. Now, based on what we've covered so far, we already understand the idea that, you know, your gimbal is actually sort of countering your motion. But there is one thing of note, and that is all these motors are only rotating. They can only sort of tilt your phone in one direction or the other. One thing they cannot do is to actually counteract any sort of movement. Like this, right? You see, if I'm pushing my phone up and down, my phone moves accordingly. Similarly, if I go left and right. However, if I were to try and keep the phone, you know, in the same position, but I do a rotation type motion, you will notice that, well, that doesn't actually shift things up very much, right? My phone is still sort of rotationally stable. That in a nutshell is what a gimbal actually does. It helps you stabilize things in rotational degrees of freedom to use a more precise term, but it is actually powerless when it comes to, you know, translations or movements. And that is why if you were to just hold your gimbal and walk normally, what you'll see is that, you know, things look pretty much okay, but there's just this little vertical bobbing. That's just what we naturally do when we walk. Really, if you think about it, every footstep we take is sort of like a very controlled fall. And of course, well, when you do that, there is this upward jerk, and that causes that little bobbing in your final footage. So how do we work around this? In order to work around this, what we do is what is known as the bent knee walk or the ninja walk. The idea is, when you walk, bend your knees a little bit and every one of your footsteps need to start sort of gently on your heel and you slowly shift your weight towards the ball of your feet, you know, moving it forwards before lifting it off. The idea is we want to sort of absorb that impact that comes from your normal footfalls, you know, the bam, bam, bam. You don't want that, you want it to start at the back and just go smoothly towards the front, like so. So yeah, that's the idea. And when you do things this way, and you know, with a bit of practice, you can actually completely smooth out your foot faults. Of course, there are other ways to work around this. Some handheld gimbals actually let you have what is known as a Z-axis stabilization. And this works because, well, it is sort of spring-loaded, and basically the weight of your gimbal setup actually gives it enough inertia so that, well, when you move the handle, you create less jerkiness on the gimbal itself. Conceptually, this is the same as, you know, those Steadicam operators with, you know, the huge vest. There is that arm coming out from that vest that also helps absorb shock in the same way. Now, moving on again to tip number three. In fact, what I've demonstrated to you earlier on is a negative demonstration, right? Something is actually wrong about the way I've actually set up my gimbal. And that is, notice that when it's actually powered off, my phone always falls off to one side. If I try to lift it up with my hand and I let go, well, it flops right down again. 
This is a situation in which the whole setup is out of balance. This side is actually much heavier. So when I actually switch on the gimbal like so, this motor at the back is working extremely hard to counter the fact that, well, half the phone is actually out of balance. See, when I switch it off, it flops right down. So you don't actually want to have that because, well, you're making one motor work extremely hard. Now, in this particular case, um, there really isn't very much I can do if I didn't actually have this counterweight. So what I have here is a little counterweight that sort of comes in the box. And what I can do is I can attach it to the back. So without actually changing anything about my phone's positioning, if I were to attach this counterweight on, what happens is now it's off balance in the other direction. So what I can then do is I can actually shift up the position of my phone, you know, relative to, you know, its holder. And after a while, what I can do is I can actually achieve a balance. So I didn't spend too much time on this. It took like, I don't know, 15 seconds. And what I've done is I've positioned my phone such that, you know, there is now a little gap, you know, at the part where it's supposed to go in. And what I've created now is basically a balance setup. So this gimbal is off, right? That's why I can actually do this. But well, no matter where I put it, you know, at least along this axis of rotation, it basically sort of holds, or at least takes a very long time to actually drop out of that position. So what I've done is I've actually created a more balanced setup. And what that means is that motor doesn't have to work quite as hard to, well, do the balancing for you. Now, why is it important to do that? There are actually several different reasons why. First and foremost is better performance. You see, the torque in which a motor can generate, that is, you know, the amount of rotational force it can create, is of course limited. If you actually dedicate some of this torque away to just getting things in balance, what happens then is that if you ever come to a situation in which you need, you know, quite a lot of torque to get things in place, you may find that performance becomes diminished because, well, you have already sort of taken away from the total that the motor itself can exert. That is one reason. Another is that you could have some impact on the battery life. You see, in a situation in which everything is nice and perfectly balanced, your motors only need to kick in when it feels that, you know, something is starting to, you know, get rotated out of position. What this means is that your motors only fire when necessary to do so. Now, compare this to when your gimbal isn't balanced at all and your motor needs to be continuously running to sort of push things in position. Well, as you can imagine, that of course consumes more power. So yeah, for you know, the optimal battery life, balance up your gimbal, and that way things don't have to actually work unnecessarily. Finally, let's move on to tip number four, which may be more device specific, but that is configuration. Now, my gimbal has several you know, different features. First and foremost, there is a joystick, so in a particular mode, for example, if I were to push on this joystick, what happens is it causes my phone to rotate. Now, another way to actually rotate my phone, again, in certain modes only, is that, well, I can simply point, you know, my phone in a direction I want it to go to. For example, if I were to twist the stick to change up the yaw axis, my phone actually follows in that direction. Now, all of these actually can be configured. There actually is a tool for this particular gimbal that allows me to change up, you know, how much I have to push and how much sort of motion that corresponds to. I can actually tweak up the acceleration, you know, how fast it actually snaps to the place it's supposed to go to. And similarly for, you know, the one where you just rotate and the phone follows, well, there are other configurations for that as well. And what I found is that, well, depending on what purpose you want to use this for, Different configurations can greatly change up the look and feel and the performance of, well, your device. In my case, I've been shooting a lot of hyperlapse video, and the thing is, because hyperlapses are sped up, well, any small rotation becomes a very big kind of rotation in the final result. And that's why generally for me, well, the movements tend to have to be very slow. So again, that is something that I could change up in a configuration. This would be different, for example, in a run and gun kind of situation. If you're sort of shooting something that is reasonably fast, but you still want stabilization, then you want your gimbal to be able to respond very quickly. You know, the moment you turn, it needs to sort of just go directly to where you want it to go to. So yeah, these are sort of the two different, very opposite use cases in which, 
different configurations can really help you. So yeah, if you have a gimbal, if it comes with a configuration tool, definitely take some time to sort of change things up, try it out, and see if you can find a set of settings that you know fit your needs perfectly. So yeah, there you go. That has been your Gimbal 101. We've taken a look at four tips today, as well as how gimbals work, what they do, and hopefully this gives you a very good general idea of, well, what gimbals are all about and what you can do to get up and running as quickly as possible. That's all there is for this Random Wednesday episode. I hope it's been useful for you. But yeah, that's basically it for today. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment, and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.